Pastor Corey here again for another weekly Facebook devotional. So I want to ask you this question. How do you define success? Um, and so I think all of us want to be successful and, and each of us will define se- success differently. And so for children or students, um, that might be, they may consider success when they finally beat, uh, or level up in a particular video game. Uh, if they finally make that cut on a particular sports team or they get that role that they want in that play or musical, or if they finally get up the courage to ask their crush out on a date. Um, for us as adults, um, we might define success as the fact that we're finally able to get that promotion that we've been looking for. Um, we're able to pay off some debt, uh, or maybe we finally get to take that vacation that we um, have desperately been wanting to, but uh, haven't made the time or found the time for. And so all of us, I think, would, would say we want to be successful and we would define success in different ways. But a better question is, instead of how do you define success, a better question is, how does God define success? And, and so I think that um, one way we're able to answer that question comes from a parable. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> a parable is an earthly story that communicates a spiritual principle. Um, and so I think if we look at um, Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 23, Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 23, we see the parable of the, the ten servants, the parable of the pounds, the parable of the minas. Um, we can get an idea of how God defines success. And so Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. For he, re- when he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then do you not, did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? We see in verse 13, Um, that the nobleman calls 10 of his servants and gives each one of them one mina or one pound. And this could, would be an equivalent to a hundred days wages for a working man. And it can be viewed as a, as a gift given by a generous master. And so kind of as a side note, uh, in this parable, we can see that, that the nobleman is viewed as Jesus and the servants are viewed as his followers. And we can see that, that Jesus provides those who follow him with gifts to be used for his service. So teaching, preaching, evangelism, service, faith, love, hospitality, music, all who follow after Jesus, he gives them gifts to be used for his service. And then we see verse 13, I mean verse 14, which is a verse that can be easily overlooked and not really sure how it fits, but it's a very important verse in understanding the whole of this, of this parable. Um, so we see that the, the nobleman knew there were people who didn't like him. Uh, and so when he gave his servants their mina and told them to invest it, he was saying, are you willing to take the risk and openly declare yourself to be my loyal servants in my absence in a situation where many oppose me? So by taking this mina and investing it, they would be declaring their support Um, and they're following of the nobleman because everyone would know where that money had come from. And so that same situation is for us today. So Jesus gives each of us gifts um, to be used for his service, 
for his glory. And oftentimes we are called to use these gifts in places where people don't like Jesus. They don't want anything to do with him. They don't want to hear about him, um, where people are opposed to him. Um, it could be in the place where you work. It could be the place where you do business. It could be at family gatherings. Um, but Jesus gives us gifts to be used for his service and for his glory. And oftentimes those are to be used in such places where Jesus is not loved or admired or honored in any way. And so another way of looking at this is that the nobleman would say something like, something like once I return, having received kingly power, it will be easy to declare yourself publicly to be my servants. But I am more interested in how you conduct yourselves when I am absent and you could have to pay a high price to openly identify yourself with me. See, there's a difference between following the nobleman when he is gone and when he hasn't received anything versus once he returns with his kingly power. So by asking them to invest this mina, the nobleman is asking his servants to publicly show their support to him, even in his absence, in uncertain times. And if we look at verse 15, we see that it says, in order to find out what they had gained with it. And now in the Greek, that is one word. It's a big phrase, but it's one word. And its primary meaning is, how much business has been transacted. And so within, within this meaning, um, with the nobleman trying, wanting to know how much business had been transacted, uh, he was seeking to discover the extent to which they had openly and publicly declared their loyalty to him while he was gone. So the nobleman's challenge was to invest the money and publicly show everyone that you were a follower and a servant of me. So when the nobleman returns, he looks at their business transactions, he looks at their ledgers, a full ledger would show that the man who, the, that this person was unequivocally, undoubtedly a follower and servant of the master. But if there was an, a, a nearly empty ledger, that would mean that that person was fearful and afraid and ashamed of, of being that, of being identified with that person, of being identified with the nobleman. So the, in verses 16 through 19, we see that the, the first two servants say to the nobleman, your gifts produce the fruit of our effort. We put in the time, we put in the effort, but we couldn't have got the results without your generous gift. We couldn't have accomplished what we did without the generous gift that you gave us to begin with. And that's the same as it is with us, or with God. We can't accomplish anything without the generous gifts that God originally gives us. Now we have to put in the time and we have to put in the effort, but we would never be able to get the results. We would never be able to accomplish anything without the generous gifts that God gives us. And so why is the nobleman pleased with the servants? It's not because they're successful. It's because they're faithful. They invested like he told them to. They weren't afraid to publicly declare their loyalty to him, even in his absence. It's not because they were successful, it was because they were faithful. We also have to ask the question, was this nobleman more pleased and more excited about the one who got 10 than the one who got five? No. He was pleased with both of them equally because they were faithful in what he had called them to do. So I think there's, there's two things we can learn from the nobleman's response to his servants. And so the first one is this is that God is not concerned with the success of his followers as the world is. God is concerned with their faithfulness. God's not concerned with the success of his followers as the world would be. God is concerned with their faithfulness. God will take care of the success part according to how he best sees fit. He calls us to be faithful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this, is that the result of their faithfulness was gaining more responsibility, not more privileges. They were not given a bigger house or a raise or a nicer chariot or a vacation or a, uh, more money in their 401k. They were given more cities to be responsible for. Our faithfulness to God does not bring with it a result of privileges. It brings with it a result of more responsibility. So gaining more responsibility in the kingdom of God is not a not to be viewed as a burden, but to be viewed as a blessing because it comes out of our faithfulness and our obedience. 
And then if we look at verses 20 through 23, we see while the nobleman was upset with the one, with the one person. So he gave him one mina, he comes back and he still had the one mina. It's not the fact that the nobleman, nobleman wasn't successful or squandered what he had because he didn't, but it was, but it was because he was not faithful to complete what the nobleman had asked. The nobleman asked him to take this money and to invest it, to show publicly that he was his servant. And he was not willing to do that. He was not faithful to be obedient to what the master, to what the nobleman had given him. So I think the spiritual principle that we need to gather from this parable is that God calls us, his followers, to be faithful and obedient in what he gives us. God handles the success part according to how he best sees fit. That's not our job. That's not our responsibility. God, through the, the work of the Holy Spirit and through the, through the sacrifice of his son and through his sovereign will, moves and works and provides the success. Our responsibility is to be faithful with what he has called us to do. So I love what um, the story about Mother Teresa. So there was a, a British journalist who asked Mother Teresa how she kept going, knowing that she could never meet all the needs of the dying who were in the streets of Calcutta. And her response echoes the spiritual principle when she says, I'm not called to be successful. I am called to be faithful. So throughout this week and throughout today and throughout this week, I want to challenge you and I want to challenge me with this question. How faithful are we being to God with what he has called for us to do with what he has given us. How faithful are you and how faithful am I being to God and what he has called us to do with what he has given us? May God continue to watch over you and your family and may you continue to see him at work everywhere and in every.